Thank you, Chard. Um, and thank you for inviting me to read here. And thanks for everyone for being here, coming out to listen to poetry. Um, thank you to Drew also and to Sundog and Yankee Books for supporting us. So, it's great to see old friends and new faces. And um, let's see, I'm going to begin with uh, a couple of acrostic poems. And, uh, these are newer poems. And uh, the first one, both of them are uh, inspired by photographs. And these are photographs by Carlotta Luke, who is, uh, works in England and on Cape Cod. And this first poem is in response to a photograph of Carlotta's mother walking on a very misty beach on Cape Cod. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Photograph of Ellen walking. Sometimes the mist our mothers walk through makes it hard for us to sing about them. Their ocean gaze so churned with lifting things up, laying things down. Sometimes we think they're unbeautiful, our mothers, then watch as an ebbing reflection tosses us a face we rise with carry through the practical day, try not to blame. Who passes with her cane, unmade by the light? Whose steps upstitch the umber strand's wide thousand-year thigh? Remember this thing we call love that says go east or west, wear sturdy shoes? We try not to trample the compass grass, but dreaming we forget. Steadfast, she parts the milky, unresolved air, as if the end of all sorrows out there. And that poem is a sonnet. Uh, this next poem um, was a response to a series of cyanotype photographs. Uh, these are chemically processed to create blue tones. Very, very old photographic method. Um, and this poem was in a book that Carlotta Luke produced called Seashore. Blue Sea. When I say the sea's a mind, it's merely my mind, swelling, cresting, sliding toward a sure shoving of depths and volumes, a way of shifting the salty wakefulness inland near the still hills, the county's tobacco farms, and a tidal river that used to float logs and flush the effluent mess of mills, but now is tidy. When you are out there, at the far revising edge of all that full foaming thought, you can maunder along, foot soles again buffed tough by beach sand, Fingers brailing the warm cheek of a stone or rolling a smooth clay pipe stem, its molded cylinder an old industrial miracle. Usually, though, it's just a calcium whistle, a dull gall's bone you've plucked from the shore's confetti rack, and it crumbles in your zeal to, uh, to ignite a present from the past. When the sea is rocking in anatomies of delivery and memory, its liquid winds spiraling along the spines of rough crossings and generational dreams, when you're all tongue with no words or country, rushing nowhere to somewhere against sly time, hear the blue sea sing out, swim that lapping back to the lit brine of beginnings. I'm going to shift back to some poems I haven't read in a good while uh, in a narrative mode from, uh, from this book, The Tyranny of Milk, my first book. Uh, and I thought I'd read this poem um, because it's a Vermont poem. And I grew up partly in Burlington, Vermont from age 11 on. <clears throat> and um, this poem is is about change, and, and Burlington has changed quite a bit from the days that I grew up there. It's called Sluts. 
Before they moved the jailhouse from the bottom of Main Street, steep hill, the convicts hollered, hey baby, when Nomi and I, all of 11 and 12, scrawny, black-haired and blonde, chocolate and vanilla, strolled by. Others wolf-whistled through steel-barred light, and a man's white hands would slip out from the shadowy inside. We knew then, for the first time, we had powers. But when we leaned out our third floor window, our f third floor bedroom window, and yelled, hey baby, to a man passing by who spun around in the street, our mother heard too and ran up those flights, one foot louder compensating for her cranky hip, and made us close the window that we could barely breathe in that summer's record humidity. Only sluts, she yelled, talk like that. Where did you learn it? No girls of mine talk like that. We could come down only for supper, no ice cream or TV, just bed. The second time our mother spoke the word, it was to our older sister who loved two boys and couldn't choose between them. You slut, she said, and our sister slammed her door and Nomi and I lay on our backs in my bed, listening to sobbing as if both of her boys had been stabbed. It was longer than anyone had ever cried in our house, not counting our mother. We knew sluts needed, uh, we knew sluts didn't need mothers to love them and saw some on Church Street with nothing on their long legs, even in winter, when one said, what are you staring at? Because we liked her red leather jacket that fell open. We turned and ran and knew we lacked what the convicts had given us. That night, we counted our ribs in the dark. Nomi's were all there. Mine were getting harder to find. Love, we knew, was related to sluts through some kind of back door, so why was everyone so upset? We thought it was the same thing, just bad timing and clothes our size on bigger girls. When the jail was gone, the tiny motel next door with its red neon vacancy sign and short row of dirty orange doors was completely exposed. Its bed soured with cigarette smoke because sluts needed something to do in between and mothers before and after visiting hours. Fathers too, whose sons had made a mistake. Just one mistake is all in some cases. Fathers sitting at the edge of those beds, burning time. Then, all those boys had to look at were each other's hard faces in the new correctional facility outside of town near Cowes. It must have seemed as if all the sluts had disappeared from the face of the earth. Though Nomi and I were right there still, slapping our sandals across the lot when they carted away the last bricks and paved it in for town parking. And we knew, as we passed through space, where cells had been, that our powers were back, but had changed, uh, and our men would come toward us, scot-free, and maybe even silent at first, around any corner now. So, um, this book is very narrative. This next poem is uh, not a typical poem for this book, but I thought it would be um, sort of like a naughty little interlude poem to read. <clears throat> it's called Scheme and Tree. What gladdens her is the spoon, with its tiny saucer of remnants, its slender shaft scrubbed last, and now the kitchen's clean. Clean are the knives and forks, all akimbo in their drying cage at the window. The spoon leans alone toward light, a backyard limb reflected in its sunken belly, so a liquid darkness tongues its curves and bends along its slender neck, making the one tidying up blush at this bed she's come upon, refractive, gleaming, the old dream of coupling, here portioned out in such a strange supper. When the light is gone, the immaculate house hushed, she puts down her book and returns barefooted, 
waking the wood planks to the kitchen. The cupboard, too, sighs, its ascending notes sliding wind clean. And even before shaking whole grains into her midnight bowl, she has reached out across the ticking low-watt world, her warm mouth clamping itself wetly around the cool, hard truth of the spoon. So um, this next poem bridges um, my childhood uh, on the West Coast. I grew, I spent my elementary school years in California. Uh, my parents are New Englanders and we moved back. So from 11 on, I was in Vermont. So this, this poem uh, takes place in both places. And um, this book uh, is very much about my father, Colt Upkeep. Uh, and, um, Many poems of elegy here. Upkeep. It wasn't the fleet Arabian I dreamed of racing through our, the grid of our Santa Clara County development, but my father's Mustang had ample horsepower and it ripped open the morning so loudly the neighbors bled complaints, which made me love him more, the man who'd inherited the fastback from Uncle Bobby who slammed his prized plane of the same name into Mojave oblivion. In middle age, dad had the Navy body repainted, a blinding carmine zipped with stripes. Not an obvious fast car man, but an old school house call doc, hardly home with his seven kids. He diagnosed problems of the human hinge, bad bones, but the flu and hearts too a fix-it man, sometimes chasing his own repair. Before dinner, we'd wait at the end of our street for a lift, his torque, the long day's last mad cure. Years later, he worried much older wheels of faith and prayer and wept often. But his Mustang still sits high and dry with its vines of rust and wrapped up myths on cinder blocks in the carriage barn. And each time I haul garbage to the bin, I see it perched there like a caged exotic cat my mother can't part with, dull without its howl and swipe, a sphinx devouring the cracked wood ribs of chairs, sparkless lamps and tarps my father stored in its night black bucket seats when the car quit. His faith faltered in the end only for bodies unfit for engineering forward. For matters of upkeep, he left us lists, small desires recorded in a slow man's racing scrawl. And I thought I would end um, with another sonnet. Um, this is a sonnet I wrote for my husband, Dean. Uh, but today, I'd like to read it for all of you. Um, and uh, poetry audiences so importantly sustain and encourage us. So thank you for listening. Uh, Wayfarer. To say I sail would not account for my whereabouts or suggest the horizon is evident or the North Star to be found. Wind rustles and retreats and it's entirely commonplace to find me plying headlong into the froth of my own wake. I do gaze. Distance is something I debate as I dream awake in ambient brine next to you. Next to you, I clang bells at the moon's milkload of wattage. I pay a medium toll for mixing up stern and bow, mast and staff, suggestible, gullible, and suggestive, evocative, sank, sunk, etc., et alia. But as I fumble metaphors in the lee of the licks and in the Milky Way's way, your field tenders its miracle magnet, tugging me through Cabo de Hornos blows, ensuring I skirt shoalings, wending home. Thanks so much.